two, one. Welcome to C in Genomic Track on day two of the APJ Genetic Solution Tour 2020. My name is Janice Kaur, and I'm your moderator for this session. This session will focus on authenticating human cell line and normalizations of microRNA expressions. First, we will hear from Dr. Steve Jackson, who is a senior member of the R&D team at Thermo Fisher Scientific. He has over 10 years of experience in genetic analysis technology and helped develop solutions for the research and healthcare market, leveraging varied technologies such as capillary electrophoresis, digital PCR, next generation sequencing, and microarray analysis at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Today, he will be talking to us about the complete workflow for the cell line authentications, CAR T and IPSC sample matching true analysis of highly variable short tendon repeat SDR. If there's any question arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit them in the Q&A box. Our speaker will address your questions following his presentation. Please join me in welcoming Steve. Hello, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Steve Jackson. I work with the content engine team at Thermo Fisher. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit today about how you can use our uh, reagents, specifically our cell line authentication kits, to make sure that your human samples are what you think they are, knowing what exactly is in your test tube. Now, this is, a, this is going to cover the fact that uh, a lot of human research these days is making use of cells that are, are human cells that are uh, taken from um, individuals and, and either passaged in culture or um, manipulated in culture before putting back into the individual for, uh, for uh, therapeutic research purposes. And so a big problem is, is making sure that um, those cells are what you think they are because you don't want to be putting the wrong cells back or studying the wrong cells um, in your research. So um, ex vivo cells are defined as uh, uh, human cells that are taken out of a tissue, blood tissue, any kind of other kind of tissue, and grown in culture, um, grown outside of the living organism, ex vivo. Um, and as I mentioned, a, a lot of these ex vivo obtained cells are being used for a lot of very important research and, and, um, and uh, health purposes. Um, and so why is it important to confirm the identity of these ex vivo human cells? Well. Um, um, it's important to confirm the identity of these cells um, um, to, you know, so that you, you know exactly what you're dealing with. Um, one of the ways that this is done is that you can confirm the identity of, of existing cell lines by comparing um, their identity to what is known about them in standardized databases like ATCC or the RECAN databases. <coughs> for, for existing cell lines, they have a, a database of, of markers that allow you to double check and make sure that your HeLa cells are actually HeLa cells. Another time this is important is when you're establishing a new cell line in vitro. If you have a new tumor cell line that you have taken out of a, of a individual and you're growing that in culture and you want to, to you know, kind of stamp it or, or uh, you know, uh, provide some kind of fingerprint of that cell line so that when you're, when you're doing experiments later on, you can go back and say, aha, this is still the cell um, characteristics that, that, uh, um, that I had started with when I started these experiments. Another uh, uh, reason this is important is if you're tracking um, human xenografts in mouse models. You've taken a cell, you've put it into a mouse, you've grown a tumor, and now you wanna see what percentage of that, or you, know, you wanna verify that that tumor is coming from a human cell. Um, the, 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 um, the kits I'll describe for you can be used for those purposes as well. And then finally, for induced pluripotent stem cell research and for CAR-T research, you're, you're taking cells out of, of an individual you manipulate them in vitro, and then um, you want to make sure that the, you, before you do something with those cells to, to, um, uh, to, to, uh, um, to put back in that individual or, or, to, or to, to make sure that they're, they are matched, um, you'll want to make sure that the fingerprints of those cells are the same as what you, uh, as what you started uh, from. 
after you've, you've made them um, um, stem cells, you want to make sure those stem cells that you've derived match the characteristics of the individual that you've got them from in the first place. So uh, making these, these, uh, these fingerprints or these profiles are very important. One big um, uh, uh, reason for doing this, again, coming back to cell lines, is that there are a very large number of cell lines that have been misidentified. There are over 500 human cell lines that are just simply wrong. Um, in fact, there are over 700 publications using the MDA-MB435 cell line, which was originally described as a breast cancer cell line, but looking at, ex at gene expression uh, patterns and other things, it was later determined to be a skin melanoma. And so um, over 700 publications um, um, of a cell line that was thought to be a breast cancer cell line are actually based off of a melanoma cell line. So it's extremely important to make sure that your cell line is, is um, accurate. It has become such a big deal that NIH and other granting agencies are making it a requirement that you have a plan for uh, authenticating your cell lines and matching the identity of your human samples over the course of your research. Um, not only the NIH, but a, a growing list of journals are requiring uh, proof of authentication before they will even, even consider publishing their paper. Um, this is, uh, slide is a few years old now, and I'm sure there are many more cell, uh, uh, publications now that demand that, uh, that in your mat uh, materials and methods, you have proof um, um, that, you have sh that you show that your cells are, um, are, are matched to what you think they should be, and that you are actually looking at, at you know, the cells that, that uh, you started off with. So for cell lines and for some of these other ex vivo therapies, it's extremely important to, to be able to show that, that they are correct. So how do we do this? Uh, the most easy way to think about this is by making a DNA profile. You probably know about this uh, uh, from, from um, 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 uh, TV shows and, and other things where uh, forensics, where you're looking at uh, making a, a molecular fingerprint of an individual here. The, the molecular fingerprint is used to, uh, to differentiate tumor individuals based on their, their pattern of alleles they have at highly variant loci. So this is a cartoon of the, of the human genome with a, a number of different chromosomes highlighted. And on these chromosomes, there are these STR regions, short tandem repeat regions, where there's extreme variability in the length of these STRs. These are used to, to, to then uh, uh, make a, a, a very distinctive fingerprint for individuals, which is uh, very, um, uh, very often uh, unique to that individual here. The way this is done is that these repeats, as I mentioned, are short sequences um, of, of, you know, between four and, and eight nucleotides long. These can, can, um, can, um, can vary, you know, in their length and number of repeats that are present. So, for example, this individual here has one allele where there are seven repeats and another allele where there are eight repeats. You can design PCR primers then that will flank this STR region and amplify them up to get a fragment that is going to be uh, a specific size for seven repeats and a slightly longer size for eight repeats. Again, these STRs are highly poly polymorphic in the human population. The allele length can be determined by the number of repeated units, like I just mentioned here, and multiplexed PCR is set up for, for looking at uh, a large number of these different, different STRs at a time. And the combination of these STRs then tell you um, the military fingerprint of that individual. Now, in our CLA identifier kits um, and our CLA global filer kits, we provide uh, an allelic ladder which is used to help line up the, these fragment lengths to uh, known alleles. What we have here is, is the, uh, the electropherogram of uh, four different channels of the allelic ladder showing the different peaks corresponding to different sizes of the possible alleles that are present in the sample. Now, the way that you do the experiment is that you, you take a, a genomic DNA preparation from, from the cell line or from the, uh, the pluripotent stem cell or whatever you're, you're trying to analyze here. You, you use the CLA identifier or the CLA global filer kit to amplify up, and you run it on your, on your CE instrument, and you compare the, 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 the pattern of peaks that you see in your, uh, in your unknown to the allelic ladder. In this case here, this M4A4 GFP, it's a cell line that I have been using um, uh, for various purposes over the years, and you can see that, that you know, it provides a distinct profile of, um, of, of peaks, um, which is unique to that cell line. 
Um, now, the, the analysis of the peaks, the, the, uh, the matching of the peak length to the allele length is done by the software. Uh, both Gene Mapper and our cloud-based software will do this for you. So it's very easy then to go from, from a genomic DNA prep to CE to an, a unique molecular fingerprint to, to authenticate your cells. And then it's simply a matter of matching up the cells to, to uh, known um, uh, profiles for um, for known cells or matching them to what you have in your database for a, for a cell line. So um, the the uh, Thermal Fisher has a couple of different um, uh, kits for doing this. We have one called the CLA Identifier Kit. Um, it makes use of five different dyes, the four different colors, and an internal uh, sizing standard. These five dyes cover 16 different STR loci, as as um, as indicated here on on the on the table. All of these uh, these loci um, are are uh, covered by the ATCC, <laughs> and so um, the ATCC database allows you to to match the allele pattern you get with a, a cell line to what they have in their database and verify that, say, your HeLa cells, or your your uh, M4A4 GFP cells, or whatever other human cells you're using are are correct. And also, the Recon and DSMZ in Europe databases also have a, a similar uh, service. So uh, from this combination, you have a probability of a match that is about 6.18 times 10 to the minus 19th uh, chance of there being an exact match between unrelated individuals or unrelated cells. Now, the CLA Global Filer Kit makes use of six different dyes instead of five. It has one additional dye channel, and we have 24 different low signs instead of 16 in the Global Filer Kit. Now, this provides extra levels of discrimination. You can see that now the chance of finding a, a match between unrelated individuals or unrelated cell lines is now 7 times 10 to the minus 28. So extremely rare, uh, extremely unlikely to have a match for unrelated um, cells. And the global filer kit is extremely useful if you really want to establish your own uh, database because you have all these other indicators that are not covered by other, um, other panels and it gives you extra levels of discrimination. So we recommend the Global Filer Kit if you're starting a, a new project where, where you're, you're cataloging, cataloging a large number of, of different samples um, um, in your own database. So um, as far as the identifier, the CLA identifier kit goes, we have two different uh, versions of this. Um, one of them requires purified DNA, but the workflow is very easy. You first start off by purifying genomic DNA. You amplify it using the reagents in the kit. You analyze it by CE, and then you and then you run it out on your on your instrument to analyze using Gene Mapper itself. And we've done some experiments, and you can you can download our application note, which goes into more detail about uh, how we've characterized the sensitivity of, of the uh, the Identifier Plus kit uh, um, using both Seek Studio and CE, and for that matter, 3130 instruments. So uh, we know that we can get down to about uh, 0.3 nanograms of input DNA and still get a completely accurate profile. Another option, which I think is a little bit more convenient, is using Identifier Direct Kit, the CLA Identifier Direct Kit. In this case, what you do is you spot out some of your, uh, your, um, your cell line um, that's in PBS or cell uh, uh, growth solution or something like that on these nucleic cards. These nucleic cards are treated paper that will lyse the cells and immobilize DNA and stabilize the DNA on the card itself. This provides a, ver a dried spot then, which is very convenient for going through and, and, and uh, and coming back to a sample without having to use up your freezer space. You just go back to this dried up card. You take a little uh, punch out of the center of the card here. You amplify it using the CLA Identifier Direct Kit, uh, electrophoresis uh, on our instruments, and analyze using Gene Mapper. Um, here's an indicator of the amount of the, uh, of the punch that you take out of these cards here. A very small punch goes right into a PCR well and added to the, the Identifier Direct Kit um, um, to, to do the experiment. And again, this is covered in our application note. You can go back to the application note and find out, you know, what uh, what concentration of cells we recommend, how they compare among the different instruments, uh, and how easy it is to use. On um, the bottom line, is we recommend at least five times ten to the fifth cells per mil as a suspension. You spot that on the copan card, let it dry, and then it, that's uh, uh, stable for at least a year at room temperature. So very convenient to use. One final thing is the Global Filer Kit. Um, uh, I don't have an example um, that shows the complete profile of, of Global Filer, but it's not necessary because here what we've done is we have matched um, a uh, buccal swab with a T cells derived from that same individual. The, the, uh, the buccal swab is shown here. I'm sorry, the, 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 uh, the T cells going in culture, the profile of one channel is shown on the top of, of this figure. 
and the buccal swab is shown here in the bottom. And you can tell that the, the CLA global filer kit is able to completely match up these alleles and, and the pattern matches uh, perfectly. So you have good confidence that the buccal swab and the T cells derived in that culture um, are from the same individual. So the um, ex vivo manipulation of human cells uh, it makes use of a lot of different, um, different uh, techniques. Um, it's not just growing cell lines, but uh, as we are, are growing more into induced pluripotent stem cells and chimeric T cells, there are a lot of, of uh, interests in making sure that ma manipulated cells uh, match up to the original donors. Um, in these cases, it's critical in, in these studies to know that where the cells started from and confirm that the identity of these cells um, are what you think is correct. Furthermore, it is also critical to confirm that once manipulated, once you've, you've made these, uh, these candidate cells into pluripotent cells or CAR T cells, that these cells have the desired characteristics um, um, of, of, of either uh, induced pluripotency or uh, they maintain the T cell characteristics and they have maintained genomic integrity. In other words, you haven't introduced new mutations, new chromosomal in, uh, rearrangements by taking the cells out and growing them in culture for a couple of passages. And so Thermo Fisher Scientific has a complete portfolio of things that will allow you to, to correctly quality control any cells um, that you have taken out of, of human beings and, and manipulated in vitro. We've, got, we've gone over the STR kits, and I, this is an example of showing how you can use the, the, uh, the um, CLA identifier and global filer kits to match up the profiles of uh, T cells and CAR T cells. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Regular, CAR -T, regular T cells and CAR T manipulated cells from the same individuals. We also have something called the carrier scan microarray, which allows you to look at the entire uh, carrier type uh, by molecular mechanisms. Um, it's a very convenient way to look at, uh, at uh, whether or not you have chromosome deletions or smaller deletions introduced within the, the, the chromosome. We have the oncomine assay that allows you to see whether or not you have um, uh, introduced new mutations into oncogenic genes. Of course, you don't want to introduce a RAS mutation in, in your cells if, you've, if you've, uh, you've grown them for a while before you put them back into the individual. Um, you, don't want, you want to make sure that you have not introduced a, a novel um, um, oncogenic mutation in the manipulations. And then finally, if you're doing uh, induced pluripotent stem cell work, you might want to make use of either prime view microarrays or TACMAN panels to look at the, uh, the pluripotency um, um, gene expression patterns in these induced cells. These, these are handy ways to, to make sure that you actually have, uh, first of all, taken the cells, you, you've made them pluripotent, and then after you then um, in, um, make the pluripotent cells down a, a different differentiation pathway, these, uh, these kits will allow you to make sure that you have you've made a mesodermic derived cell or an endodermic derived cell or, or something along those lines. So for those that are, that are doing uh, IPSC research, um, these pluripotency determination panels are very useful for, for quality, quality control of the cells and making sure they are uh, doing what you want them to. So an example of, of how the induced pluripotent stem cells can be used to match with donors. Um, I did an experiment with uh, um, an individual at the Stanford uh, um, um, University Stem Cell Core Center. He provided me with a bunch of samples that were blinded. Uh, these were, were either donor samples, genomic DNA from, from donors, or from induced pluripotent stem cells he made from these same donors. And he completely mixed them up and blinded me to them um, because he wanted to see how well the, the STR kits are able to match up and, uh, and, and, and identify um, uh, pairs of donor and, and, uh, and manipulated cells. Um, I used the, the CLA identifier kit to do the experiment. I, I generated the profiles and was able to, to match up 100% accurately from 24 different donors. Um, the the, um, the uh, blinded donor and, and IPSC pairs, and he was very impressed by that. We wound up writing up an application note. Um, you can see uh, Dr. Wang here. Um, and and um, um, you can, you can uh, see a little bit more about the study in, in that application note. In addition, um, the um, in addition uh, in uh, conjunction with the um, the um, a group in, in Carlsbad, the, the stem cell research group in Carlsbad, we generated a uh, paper that was published in Regenerative Medicine that describes how you can use the uh, pluripotency panel and the STR kits uh, for doing the quality control of iPSCs and uh, pluripotent stem cell research. 
Just a couple more things. Um, the ideal time to authenticate is once you're, you have taken a cell out of an individual and um, before you do very much with it. You want to establish that fingerprint as soon as you possibly can so that you, you have a, a, a known uh, uh, identity you can go back to you know, after you have grown these things in culture for a while or after you've stored them at minus 80 for years or, or, or something like that. So it's best to confirm the provenance or the, the, the um, establishment of cell lines when you start to make them. Um, they're also good. Uh, it, you should authenticate when you're confirming an existing, uh, uh, confirming identity in an existing cell line. For example, you receive a, 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 a group of HeLa cells or a, an aliquot of HeLa cells from, uh, from your, your colleague down the hall. You want to make sure that they are HeLa cells. And so um, you, you can, you know, use the STR kits to verify that they are HeLa cells and you establish them with that STR panel what that STR um, genotype is before you embark on your experimental um, paradigm. It's a good idea to make sure after each passage that you haven't uh, contaminated your cells with different cells and cells are, are still what you think they should be. So it's a good idea to run an aliquot um, after each, each passage or each couple of passages, again, just to make sure that the cells are maintaining the identity that you want them to. And again, when you receive a cell line from, from either an individual or from a public database, um, it's a good idea to just run a check and make sure that the, the uh, molecular profile is correct. And there are guidelines for, for how good a match is a match. Um, basically, uh, there are a couple of papers that have shown that, that if the, uh, if the um, look, if you, if you categorize the, the alleles, you match them up to known samples, and you use this formula here um, to, uh, determine the, the percent that are uh, matching the, uh, the reference. And the, these papers recommend that if at least 80% of the, of the alleles match the reference, then the cells are related to each other. So that's a very good guideline that we recommend following for, uh, for, uh, you, for knowing how good a match is a match, recognizing that over time, some of the cells may drift genetically a little bit. So just in conclusions, I uh, just want to say that uh, the, these STR um, t sequences are very useful for authenticating human cell lines. Um, these are, are cell lines that have either been well established or that are being used for, uh, for ex vivo cell therapies or for even vaccine developments to make sure that the cells that you're using in your vaccine development um, are the correct ones um, um, and, and you're using what, what you think you um, should be using. The Identifiler Plus and the uh, and the uh, the uh, CLA Global Filer kits can be used with as little as 0.3 nanograms of genomic DNA to authenticate cell lines. Um, we recommend one nanogram, but it can go lower if the need uh, is there. And as little as uh, five times ten to the fifth cells per mil can be used to authenticate um, cell lines using the copanucleic cards and the Identifiler Direct kits. Um, I, in, in data that I don't show here, but in the application note, uh, we can see at least uh, if, if contaminating cells are, are part of your population and they make up at least 20% of the population, you can detect the differences by using the, ident the uh, um, identifier and global filer kits. And finally, Thermo Fisher Scientific provides tools and applications that allow you to QC your cells that are, that are analyzed in, the, in vivo. And these include uh, not only uh, molecular fingerprinting, but karyotype analysis, oncogenic analysis, and, and pluripotency analysis. So finally, I thank you very much for your time. I'd also like to thank David Yoder, PhD, for uh, doing a lot of the work behind the, the, the um, um, characterization of the CLA uh, identifier panels. Uh, Uma Lakshmipathy Lakshm and her team um, in Carlsbad for doing the uh, um, uh, CAR-T studies and the IPSC studies I talked about, and Kamini Varman and her team for support at Thermo Fisher Scientific. And I thank you again for your time. Have a good day. Thank you, Steve, for the excellent talk. We will now move into the live Q&A portions of the presentation. As a reminder, please submit your question via the Q&A box. There are Several questions coming through. The first question, when we pass a cell line many times over the years, don't we expect to have changes in the cell line? And what do you suggest to avoid major changes to our stock of cell lines? Yes, I would expect that over time that there will be genetic drift, that you will, you will find that there are rearrangements in chromosomes uh, and, and um, changes in the length and the number of copies of the STR uh, loci. So 
yes, over time, growing cells and culture will, uh, will, you know, will eventually acquire new mutations and new characteristics. The way to overcome that is that once you've established a cell line or in your laboratory, or once you um, obtain cells in your laboratory, it's good to, to freeze them away and use those as a stock that you go back to as your, as your starting stock and, and continually uh, freeze away cell lines from sub-passages of those. You go back to your, that, that, that initial um, uh, passage every, like, depending on how quickly your cells find, um, uh, you find your cells are changing. Um, go back to that, that initial passage, those early passages of cells, um, and pull them out when you see that the change is too much. Uh, using the STR kits will allow you to, to sort of uh, see the drift a little bit because um, the, the STRs might change in their um, uh, number of alleles and the length of the alleles. Thank you, Steve. Our second question is, um, what you are presenting here are about human cell lines. Does it true uh, apply for other animals, species cell line as well? Absolutely. Um, that, you know, any, any cell line you take out of, of an animal, grow, and culture will be subject to the same sorts of genetic drifts and, and, and possible contaminations um, that human cells do. And, and there are STRs for the various different organisms that can be used in a similar way. Unfortunately, Thermo Fisher at this time doesn't have kits available for, for doing STRs on, say, mouse or rat or, or, or kangaroo cell lines. Um, but you might be able to find uh, um, in the literature uh, some of the STR loci that have been defined for them and designed primers and analyze them in a similar manner. Okay, our third question. What are the instruments used in the dilution experiment? Um, I did all of the characterizations on 3130s, 3500, and Seek Studio instruments. Uh, I used a variety of different polymer lengths and, and uh, polymers, I'm sorry, capillary lengths and polymers, um, and found that that gene mapper can pretty much handle, you know, um, the, the analysis um, pretty much equivalently on, on them. It would be important then to match up the capillary length um, with, the, with the bins um, defined by, by the, the uh, CLA identifier kits um, and, and the, uh, uh, the human forensics uh, um, um, bins and panels that, are, that those are based off of. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, so I think we'll have the last two questions. Uh, in your opinion, can a major drift change the behavior of the cell line towards viruses, for example? I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. Can you repeat that? Uh, in your opinion, can a major drift change the behavior of the cell line towards viruses, for example? Okay, so if I understand the question, can, can major drifting, genetic drifting, change the behavior of a cell line um, in, in response to viruses or, or antivirals, um, you know, et cetera? Um, the answer is, is eventually yes. Um, it really kind of depends on the virus um, and the cell line on how quickly some of those changes might happen. Remember, most of the time these things happen semi-randomly, uh, and so um, it's, it's basically just a matter of time before you start to see things that affect the biology that you're studying. So the answer is yes, but I can't give you any kind of guideline as to how long it would take before you would see changes um, either in the drift or in the, in the biological response that you're measuring. Thanks, Steve. Our last question would be, where could I download the dilution experiment conducted on this device or kit? Um, the, the experimental details are in the application notes available on our web page. I don't have the URL in front of me, but you can contact your local representative um, and, um, to, to find out what the exact uh, um, uh, URL for the website would be. Thank you, Steve, again uh, for the excellent uh, Q&A session. Our next speaker is Dr. Emily Zeringer and Dr. Harry Zervery Slingum. Emily is the R&D scientist for sample preparation bioscience at Thermo Fisher Scientific. She has worked as a part of R&D for over 15 years and has contributed to multiple projects for a wide range of sample types library preparation for sequencing and purification and analysis of exosomes. 
Harita is the Senior Product Application Scientist for the Genetic Science Division of Thermo Fisher Scientific. She has over 10 years of experience in product development on real-time PCR assay for gene expressions and microRNA analysis. Today, they will be talking to us about how to identify stable express microRNA and the workflow to identify normalizer in serum and plasma using Tatman array cards, plates, and open array. If there's any questions arise during the presentations, we encourage you to submit them in the Q&A box. Our speaker will address your questions in the following Q&A sessions. I would like to invite Emily and Harita for the presentations. Over to you, Emily and Harita. Hello, thank you so much for having us. Um, today, what we'll be presenting is strategies to normalize microRNA expression in serum and plasma. Um, and so, very quickly, uh, the agenda we have on top for today. Uh, first is very briefly to discuss uh, why um, we talk about microRNA and kind of why uh, we'd like to use it um, in different downstream applications. Uh, second, uh, challenges to being able to normalize microRNA um, to be able to get the most out of uh, the data. And then solutions and strategies to handle each of these challenges. And then a very brief uh, Q&A session at the end. So first, um, why the interest in microRNA? Um, there's actually several reasons um, that make it a good analyte target for further research um, and study. Uh, the first is it's a very well understood regulation pathway. Um, it unique and ubiquitous post post-transcriptional regulators, which are well conserved. Um, really, another key feature is that microRNA, they regulate multiple messenger RNAs, and then you have um, a messenger RNA can be regulated by several microRNAs. So, provide you with many targets of study. Um, they also have roles in many human diseases, and so it makes them a very good candidate um, for uh, biomarkers and potentially methods of treatment. Um, so very interesting analyte, um, but not without its challenges. Um, and you can see here uh, we've listed six uh, challenges um, from sample all the way to uh, analysis that we've run across and also run across um, in various papers when working with microRNA. Um, and so here you can see sample type um, is one of them. Um, microRNA is mostly of interest in um, biofluids, um, which present their own challenges. And then, of course, you have donor-to-donor uh, -donor variation. Um, um, when looking at the microRNA, they're, they're very differentially expressed from donor-to-donor -donor just normally. Um, then, of course, sample collection handling, RNA purification extraction and storage, um, and then, of course, quantity and quality. Um, all of these have the potential to introduce variation into your workflow, um, which can make it difficult to discern <clears throat> if any changes you see in expression pattern are really um, due to a specific variable or just inherent to um, the workflow you're using. Um, and unfortunately for microRNA, it's difficult to rely on standard methods like endogenous controls. And so in our talk today, we'll actually um, ident um, identify not identify, but um, kind of describe ways to handle four of the six um, challenging um, parts uh, to normalization. Um, collection handling, storage, purification extraction, and then RNA, microRNA, quantity, and quality. So the first thing, uh, sample handling. And when you talk about sample handling, um, we talk about this is kind of collection of the original sample, any pre-processing steps required, and then, of course, storage. <clears throat> prior to any use in a analysis workflow. And so sample handling, again, here you can see they're kind of defined into three different areas. Um, so a lot of variation in microRNA expression um, can be due to um, you know, collection, pre-processing, storage, um, you know, affecting recovery, affecting, you know, for example, if when you collect a sample, um, you know, if you don't store it properly, the expression pattern changes from start to finish and you're not able to get a real idea um, of what is the true expression pattern and what is just um, 
a result of your process. And so um, the easiest way to, um, for sample pre-processing is to kind of standardize. You know, and when I say pre-processing, for example, this can include phase separation, mixing steps, um, you know, incubation is required. Um, for example, if you need plasma from a blood tube, you have to do the phase separation to separate it from the white and red blood cells. Um, and so by standardizing these different steps, um, you provide consistency, um, especially if you're receiving samples from multiple different labs or, um, you know, you have multiple um, different collection events, um, having a standardized process um, reduces variation um, and so you're able to have more confidence in your results. Um, an example of this kind of standardization um, is an SOP, so you know, I, one was developed by the Early Detection Research Network for working with plasma and serum. Um, and so it's made it much easier to compare different data sets and then to compare different samples and donors. Um, in addition to sample pre-processing, once that's complete, as a, you know, if you can't work with your sample right away, um, you know, you do need to store it. And storage can be very important. Um, as we know, microRNA, even microRNA, RNA in general, even microRNA, which is often protected by exosomes or protein complexes, you know, is very prone to degradation. And of course, degradation will harm or, you know, interfere with the true expression pattern um, and interfere with your downstream analysis. And so storage is important. Um, generally, unless you're using some type of stabilization reagent, such as RNA later, which gives you a little bit more flexibility on temperature, um, the colder the better, um, especially for longer term storage. So, um, you know, we like to store, um, for example, serum plasma at minus 80 or colder if you're going to, it's going to be one week, more than one week between collection and process. You know, however, um, um, for, you know, if you're going to collect your sample and process that same day, um, then, of course, four degrees um, is fine for those eight hours. Um, so now that you have your sample, you've stored it and, uh, properly, um, another potential source of variation is your RNA purification. Um, you know, and if you... you your RNA purification method is subpar, then of course that'll affect your recovery and, you know, you may not be able to detect um, kind of lower occurring microRNAs um, and thus that will, you know, cause variation or problems um, detecting a true expression pattern. And so when it comes to microRNAs, several challenges to consider. You do need a strong lysis step. As I mentioned, a lot of microRNAs are stored in exosomes or protein complexes, and so you need a strong lysis in order to release the microRNAs from that. And so the way to do that is through organic solvents, for example, triazole, or a mechanical or enzymatic lysis, um, such as with protease K. Um, you also want to try to remove um, as much as DNA as possible to enrich the concentration of your microRNA as much as possible to be able to detect, um, you know, very low occurring as well as the, the high occurring uh, targets. Um, and so there's several methods that um, will provide this strong lysis step as well as DNA removal. Um, the first is your organic base. This is going to be your trizol combined with an ethanol um, cleanup or a column cleanup at the end. Um, there's your column-based systems, for example, um, like the Mervana Paris. Um, these are more mid-throughput, um, but again, these do still require kind of more organic upfront. Then finally, you have your high-throughput high throughput solutions, your magnetic bead-based. Um, this is generally going to use your enzymatic treatments in order to lyse your sample. Um, so you are able to easily um, you know, process a high throughput or a large number of samples at one time. Um, you know, however, you know, as RNA purification, even if you have a good method, there is still some donor-to-donor -donor variation to consider, which can affect your ability to recover, um, you know, as much RNA as possible from your sample. And so you want to make sure that your purification method or extraction method um, is performing um, optimally for all your samples. And a good way to do this is by using an extraction control to monitor recovery. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a good um, check or a good addition um, to use um, with your normalization method to really give you confidence that the expression pattern differences you see are true um, and real. 
And so, um, unfortunately for microRNA and for message RNA, you can use a lot of times endogenous messenger RNA. Um, it's pretty stable between donors as your control. But for microRNA, this isn't as useful um, or as consistent. Um, and so, for microRNA, we um, try to use with more synthetic type of uh, samples. Um, and these include um, kind of um, what I've been using is our Mirvana microRNA mimics. Um, they're modified in order to protect the RNA from anything in the sample um, that could degrade it. And so it makes it ideal for use with serum plasma. So you can spike it into your sample and then monitor it all the way through um, to the PCR detection. And so here's just an example of a workflow. Um, you can see um, I've used two C. elegans microRNA and spiked them into human serum and plasma and then extracted them with our Magmex Mirvana kit um, along with any um, microRNA in the sample um, and then performed PCR using our TACMAN advanced microRNA uh, workflow. Um, and so what you can see here is looking at five different donors for both serum and plasma. Um, if you look at the specific um, synthetic microRNA targets, um, the uh, detection Patterns very consistent from donor to donor, so you're not seeing a lot of effect from the donor, especially for the um, the Lin 4 5 p The other uh, nice thing is if you actually, um, you know, here are two samples with the spike in, and then a sample with no spike in, and you can see um, here we're looking at MIR16 targets. There is no effect on the expression pattern of MIR16 um, in the serum plasma by using the spike in. Um, and so you're able to see good uh, extraction and detection um, all the way around. So extraction control is a good addition um, to make sure your RNA purification is working um, and then to make sure that any normalization um, also will work as well. So at this point, um, I am actually going to hand it off to my colleague Karita to uh, talk about the last two topics. All right. Um Emily, thank you so much for that nice overview of sample handling um, purification. Um, and now we will uh, move on to our next topic, which is um, how what are the solutions available to um, quantify uh, RNA as well as uh, normalization techniques. So uh, with respect to um, the tools that are available for quantification, we have two unique chemistries that are offered um, by the TACMAN chemistry. Um, the first is the TACMAN microRNA assays. These are um, assays which are designed to specifically detect microRNAs from samples, and they come with a uh, microRNA-specific reverse transcription um, step, uh, followed by microRNA-specific real-time detection of uh, the target of interest. The other chemistry that is uh, offered um, uh, is also TACMAN based. Uh, however, this is based on universal reverse transcription, wherein all uh, microRNAs that are present in a sample are reverse transcribed at the same time. Uh, for this uh, technology, we have polyadenylation happening at the three prime end and adapter ligation at the five prime end. Uh, following cDNA synthesis, uh, microRNAs of interest can be detected using TACMAN advanced microRNA assays. So you can see that the two uh, chemistries complement each other very well and can be used for specific applications um, uh, to, to get a broader coverage. Both these chemistries are available in four different formats, uh, again, to facilitate wide array of research. Um, single tube assays, as you can see, provide the maximum flexibility, um, although these are more suitable for low throughput uh, analysis um, and applications such as verification. Tacman array plates are um, uh, uh, come with pre-spotted assays, both um, uh, legacy and advanced assays, more suitable for s small to medium throughput analysis, and um, you can investigate um, anywhere from 96 to 384 samples, um, ideal for verification and discovery. TACMAN array cards are also pre-spotted, um, however, these are probably more suitable for discovery and profiling studies and enable um, the customer to investigate up to eight different samples at the same time. Our highest throughput uh, 
platform is the open array um, arrays uh, plate where um, uh, both chemistries could be pre-spotted and they allow you to investigate up to 48 different samples. So those are the different uh, chemistries and uh, formats that are available for quantification. With that, um, I'm going to move on to normalizing microRNA um, qPCR data. Uh, and uh, like most other uh, microRNA um, RNA expression analysis, microRNA analysis is also uh, very critical, and uh, the reason behind that is because any variability that you observe in your samples should be a reflection of the biology behind it, um, and hence normalization is important to remove um, the, the differences that come in because of um, you know samples, um, because of technical variability, uh, and things like that. And so normalization is extremely critical. MicroRNA um, uh, qPCR data is typically normalized um, in three different ways. And uh, to make um, uh, these different strategies more understandable, I will go through some of the case studies um, and we'll go delve a little deeper into what each of these uh, strategies uh, brings in. So first, looking at global mean normalization. Uh, to demonstrate global, global mean normalization, which is often used to normalize large sets of data in which several hundred or several thousand targets um, are investigated. Um, and how does this work? Well, in global mean normalization, we look at uh, targets that are common to all samples in a study, identify the CQ mean, um, of all of these targets, and then use the CQ, um, sorry, CQ median, and use the CQ median as a normalization factor for all targets in the sample study. So that's the um, the the basis of uh, global mean normalization. And uh, for uh, demonstrating that, what we did was we used uh, a small sample set of uh, matched normal and diseased plasma from donors who were previously identified with uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Um, samples were um, extracted, stored, sorry, stored and extracted uh, as uh, described by Emily in the few uh, earlier slides. They were reverse transcribed with the TACMAN advanced microRNA cDNA synthesis kit and then processed on the TACMAN open array human advanced microRNA panel. These arrays were run on the Quant Studio 12K Flex system, and data from these was analyzed on the Thermo Fisher Connect um, using RQ app. Um, and to demonstrate global normalization, we used global, global normalization as uh, uh, the option for data analysis. What did we find? Uh, we found that when data was analyzed and we um, looked at um, clustering of um, differential gene expression between the four samples that we looked at. Um, the data clustered by um, uh, the phenotype of the samples. So the disease samples were clustered together um, while the normal samples were clustered together, which was what was expected for uh, the set of samples. All right, so that's one way of normalizing data. The other uh, very uh, widely used um, strategy to normalize uh, gene expression data is the use of endogenous or reference genes. But the challenge with um, finding reference genes for microRNA is that um, most microRNAs are known to be variably expressed in, in tissues and biofluids, and hence it's very difficult to find uh, microRNAs that are are um, uh, uniformly expressed in any tissue, and especially in serum and plasma. Historically, SNO RNAs um, and U6 RNAs were used uh, as reference genes. However, because the biogenesis of SNO RNAs um, or U6 RNA is so different from that of microRNAs, uh, based on MIKEY guidelines, we are moving away from that recommendation. Um, also, Mikey guidelines suggest that while normalizing um, uh, expression data using endogenous control, you should at least have two or 
three different reference genes uh, which are stably expressed in um, a set of samples. So because of these challenges, one of the first things we recommend um, customers to do is to identify those reference genes or normalization genes in their set of samples. And for that, uh, we have a very um, nicely um, uh, defined workflow, which is a systematic way of identifying these genes. Um, and we recommend uh, using a spike in control, like the one that Emily mentioned earlier in the slides. In this case study, we use the CL against uh, MER39 3P as a spike in control into plasma samples. And um, RNA was extracted uh, using the MagMax Mirvana kit, followed by um, uh, cDNA synthesis and qPCR this time on uh, the human endogenous control cards. The control cards consist of 30 unique microRNAs that are known to be stably expressed in various samples, including serum and plasma. Um, and this information is based on literature. So um, we ran uh, these cards on the uh, Quant Studio VS7 system and analyzed the data on Thermo Fisher Connect, like previously. This um, case study resulted in um, identification of three microRNAs in our samples, which were found to be uniquely stable. So these were um, HSA MER 19A3P, HSA MER 451A, and HSA MER 939-5P. Once we had identified these three genes as stably expressed in our samples, we used them um, as our reference genes in the sample set that was earlier um, run through um, the OpenArray platform. And this time, instead of choosing global mean normalization for data analysis, we chose endogenous controls and picked the three genes, which were earlier identified, as our normalizing um, genes. And what did we find? Well, we found that the uh, differential expression um, uh, that we obtained from um, using global mean normalization and that obtained using reference genes were, was uh, remarkably uh, concordant, so very similar kind of data you observe. Um, Although keep in mind that it is important that both these strategies for normalization have a place in its own. So global mean normalization is typically recommended for large high throughput studies, and reference genes could be used both for high throughput studies and for smaller sets of studies, but it's critical to identify the right reference genes in your set of samples. Um, although I used OpenArray uh, to demonstrate um, uh, the, these different strategies, I just want to point out that all of the panels that are available in the OpenArray format are also available in the Tatman Array card format. And here is a data set which shows that the differential gene expression data you get from one format versus the other, in this case, Statman array cards versus open array is very similar, and they could be used based on particular application. With that, a quick review of what we learned today. Uh, we learned that it was important to um, collect samples and store them um, uh, you know, as recommended, um, as Emily went through uh, the recommendation. We also learned that there are uh, many different, um, actually two different chemistries that are available in, in many different formats, uh, which could be custom um, used for different applications, and that data normalization of microRNA qPCR data is extremely critical, and it's important to choose the right strategy. With that, uh, we will now take some questions. Thank you, Emily and Marita, for the excellent talk. We will now move into the Q, live Q&A portions of the presentation. So we have several questions coming in. Uh, the first question will be to Emily. The expression control can help to a certain extent, but control RNA is different from the sample, including their microenvironment. 
Besides the extraction control, are there other ways of controlling the quality of extractions? Um, so yeah, to answer that question, um, there are other ways. Um, generally, this will be, I'm assuming the question means a testing for um, optimal lysis of the cells um, in the sample in order to get to the nucleic acid. Um, the easiest way are to do actual intact cell controls, um, you know, to measure the ability to recover RNA and to lyse. Um, the spike in controls we discussed here are more meant for normalization um, and to look specifically just at the RNA recovery, um, not necessarily at the lysis efficiency. Thank you, Emily. The second question for you would be, which method is the best for RNA extraction for high purity yield? Um, so really that's going to depend on kind of what throughput you need and the sample type you're working with. Um, you know, our extraction methods, both our high throughput bead-based method, the MagMax systems, as well as our column purification, like the Pure Link or the standard Nirvana, um, both generate a very high pure um, RNA and high yield of samples. Um, so really both will work. It just depends on you know, which better fits your throughput needs. Thank you, Emily. Um, so the next question I would like to direct to Harita. Your question would be, besides TagMan, are there other chemistry for microRNA analysis by real-time qPCR, like any other platform for real-time RT-PCR that does not use probe? Um, so the two chemistries that we offer for both for RTP-PCR are um, based on um, the TACMAN probes. Um, we do have other um, solutions which are not RTQPCR based, such as the microarray um, assays, the detection of microRNA. Um, but for RTQPCR, we only have uh, TACMAN based assays. The second question for Harita is, can the normalization be itself the source of error in some cases? And how do you decide what kind of normalization to use? Yes, normalization is actually a very key component of how um, the RTQPCR experiments um, uh, should, you know, can be analyzed and um, the choice of normalization can skew the data any which way. So it is very, very important to choose the right um, method for normalization. And um, I think we went through uh, a couple of different ways. It really depends upon your sample and, um, you know, the kind of uh, targets that are um, stably expressed. So if there is a target that is stably expressed, then um, uh, you know, they can be used as a normalizing agent. Otherwise, um, as we went through in the presentation, spike in controls are a good choice um, or uh, using global mean norm normalization. So the three options available and um, the kind of samples and the availability of different, um, uh, the presence of different uh, uh, tar which are targets which are normally expressed um, in the samples will will decide uh, which which methodology to choose. Okay, the last question we have: Can you use more than one kind of normalization or combine with certain assays? Um, so uh, you could probably normalize your uh, data two different ways and and make sure that you know the results are similar um they should if if the technique is correct then as i had shown in in my slides um no matter which way you normalize you should still get a very similar result the um the expression uh, pattern should be similar um you could but i don't think there is a way to really use uh, two different ways in a same set of experiments like together, it might be difficult to do. I, I'm not aware of any uh, analysis software which will help you do that, but you can definitely do it two ways. 
Thank you, Harita. So, so with this, uh, I would like to thank you for all the questions and the speaker for your time to be here today. As a final reminder, any questions that were submitted and were not answered today by our speaker will be addressed by, via email. This ends the QC in genomic session. We will now take a 15 minutes break before we start the next session in other tracks. So you can have a coffee and visit our booth. Learn about some very exciting promotions that is made available to you, where you can ask questions to our Thermal Fisher representative. Please also participate the scavenger hunting games. Look for our icons in the environment to win prizes. There will be a pop-up survey appearing in a minute. Please help us to complete the survey. And thank yous and speak to you again in 15 minutes.